this for about 21 years now, and um, I guess the main thing that I, the reason I do this is um, I'm trying to teach the lessons of the Holocaust. I think in America we're learning a lot about the Holocaust, but I'm not sure we're learning from it. And so uh, I believe there's a lesson for all human beings in what happened in the Holocaust that it could, could and actually has happened again. And so I use the Holocaust history to challenge Americans to look at the presence of racism, hatred, prejudice, and intolerance in their communities, in their schools, in their families, and in their individual hearts. Because I think there's many, many lessons to be learned, a warning to the future from the Holocaust, what happened in Germany. And that's my motivation in, uh, in doing this message. 20 minutes later, one of those guards in black is standing right behind you. You don't know he's there. Two minutes later, he shouts a command. He shouts as loud you jump, he scares you. The command is immediately repeated by every guard standing on the platform. What do they start shouting at you? Something like this. Get on the train! Board the train! Yes, schnell! Einsteigen! That's not a people train. The people train's coming on this track. That's the one you're waiting for, right? The train back over here, everybody knows? That's the train, the cattle cars of which they used to haul the pigs and cattle to market once a month. And everybody also knows, one, at least once a month, they use these same cattle cars to haul the dead or diseased carcasses out of the, of the pigs or cows out of your village to be destroyed. When the wind is right on the hottest of summer days, your family can't use this garden. Why? The stench from these cars reaches your garden three kilometers away. You shut your mouth, you grab some of your luggage, and you run down this line of cattle cars. And you're fast. You get all ahead of everybody else. You get to this one cattle car first. You drop the stuff you're carrying. You hoist yourself up into the car. You're on all fours. You stand up. And immediately, you gag. You come this close to vomiting. Why? The smell inside this car makes you sick. What is it? Well, it's the smell of the dried or not so dry pig or cow manure. Or worse yet, the parts of the dead or diseased carcasses of the pigs or cows left rotting in the corners of these cars in the sun. If by 10 after 2, you've got to go to the bathroom. And now you've come to find out that's what the old rusted metal can in the other corner is for. When you can stand it no longer, you start shoving your way across this crowded cattle car. The only You become where you've stepped in something. At that instant, a smell so awful strikes you, it physically blows you back like this. The people behind you angrily shove you forward. You look down at the dim light, and you curse loudly. You should have known or been able to figure it out. An old rusted metal can, maybe slightly bigger than this, nearly 24 hours, over 80 people. The old rusted metal can has long since proved itself inadequate for its intended purpose. The old rusted metal can has long since filled, it's overflowing on the floor, and you're standing in it. And the smell is overwhelming. And the people trapped in this corner, they curse at you. They tell you, get the hell out of here and make your mess in your own corner. We don't need it here. Your cattle cars have been left sitting on an old rail siding in some village somewhere in the sun. Why? They must have needed your engine for something more important somewhere else. You wanted to scream, what's more important than our lives? The train isn't moving anymore. What little airflow had come through the crevices was now gone. You did not think this was physical, physically possible, but 25 minutes proved you wrong. With no airflow, the interior temperature rose even hotter. Within 30 minutes, you are in physical pain. You literally feel as if your body is burning up from the inside out. You sense that death is close. You sense you're about to die, and you welcome it. You want out of this nightmare. You stagger to the side of the car to take what you believe will be your last look at the outside world before you die. You look through a crevice, and something you see a block and a half away from where you're trapped shocks you so greatly, it pulls you back from the edge of death. What do you see? A block and a half away over here, there's a small park in this village you're in. And for some people, it's a beautiful sunny afternoon in late June. You actually see three mothers walking together through this park. You hear them talking. Can you make out the words? No, but you hear their voices. You watch, see, and hear them laughing together. How do you know these three women are mothers? Well, that's very obvious. Each one of them is pushing her own baby carriage. One of the carriages actually has a little umbrella that you watch that mother move around to make sure her baby stays in the shade. You take your eyes away from this peaceful afternoon scene and you rub them in disbelief. Why disbelief? Well, think about this for a minute. Let's snapshot this scene. 
Here you are trapped and suffering with those you likely love and care about most in life, your family, all of you dying of hunger and thirst, two of the worst ways it is for human beings to die. You watching your grandparents suffer, you being helpless to do anything for them, fearing are they going to, serve, are they going to die tonight, next, the next freezing night, they, is this going to be their last day on earth? You yourself are standing or kneeling in raw human sewage. Your nostrils and throat are burning or bleeding with every breath. There's a pile of dead bodies, dead human bodies, growing higher by the day, including dead children. All of that, in a block and a half away, there's mothers with baby carriages. This cannot be real. You Over here, here, in these cattle cars, we're not pigs and cattle here, we're human beings, and, and people are dying. Children are dead, dead children. Water, give us water, help us, please, water. It wasn't long, but that's all the time it took. For three vicious guard dogs, 100 meters away, as soon as you started shouting, you heard their snarling and vicious barking. You turned and watched. As soon as you started shouting, they came running at full gait. In that short span of time that I just paused, that's all the time it took for them to reach the train. And you stood in shock as they came not only right to your cattle car, but right to the corner of the car behind which you were located. These dogs stood barking viciously right up at your corner of the car. They had been trained to locate shouts like these, and over the years they had a great deal of practice. You stood watching them barking viciously up at you. Within 40 seconds, two guards in black entered your narrow field of vision, each of them holding a heavy Schmeiser machine gun. Their eyes searched the crevices of this corner of the car where the dogs were pointing. What, finally, one of those guards' eyes locked in your eyes through the crevice. You almost turned away, but somehow you couldn't. You stared back at him. You stared him right in the eyes as you watched. You saw to your peripheral vision. You saw him raise the barrel at Schmeiser till it was pointed right at your head. You swear you saw his thumb go for the safety. With the barrel of that Schmeiser machine gun pointed right at your head, that guard looked into your eyes through the crevice of that cattle car, and with a viciousness in his voice, he told you to shut up or we'll fire into the car. The mothers with their baby carriages, you watched them hurry away in the distance. You pulled yourself up, and you stood in shock at the panoramic vision that opened up in front of you through the crevice of that cattle car wall. As far as your eye could see in both directions, electrified barbed wire fences with guard towers at regular intervals, manned by guards with heavy caliber machine guns. Hundreds of barracks in an enormous field back over here, hundreds more over here. Straight out from your cattle car, a train trestle running back into a pine forest. Above the pine trees, you saw protruding large rectangular brick chimneys. You heard a rumbling noise like thunder in the distance. You finally saw where it was coming from. Those chimneys, dark, heavy black smoke, was blasting out of those chimney tops. Whatever was burning back there, you knew was burning with such intensity, the smoke would gather under the chimney top and then blast out of the narrow opening, creating a sound like thunder. You heard vicious dogs snarling over here, followed by human screams. You literally felt as if you were looking into the gates of hell. Finally, you heard chains rattling down the line. You realized you'd arrived. After what seemed an eternity, they reached your title car. They undid the lock, the chain, the bar, they smash that door open. A blast of air and light blows into your car and knocks you back. You fall and hit your head. Heavy hands grab your ankles. They drag you out of the cattle car, the sewage pouring into the gutter. You lived a hundred lives and suffered a thousand deaths in that cattle car. In that one week's time, your grandmother has died. In that one week's time, your dream to become a doctor has vanished. In that seconds later, the dead bodies come flying out. Three times, you hear a dead body cry out as it hits the pile meaning they're not all dead yet. You're the only one who seems to notice as the living are left piled amongst the dead. You wait respectfully until you see your grandmother's body hit the top of the overloaded wagon. She almost rolls off the other side. From a distance of 30 meters, that will be your final goodbye to your grandmother. You will spend the rest of your life trying to rid your memory of that final horrific image of her. You will wish to remember her as she truly was in gentler, more loving times. Somehow that violent final image will never leave your mind. There are now eight or nine hundred of you gathered on this platform, ten or fifteen rows deep. A wave of silence swept the crowd. Even the children grew silent. Witnesses years later would call this an awesome stillness. A minute or two later, the stillness is broken by a car motor. You look over the heads, a car pulls up on the platform. It stops. A guard opens the back door of the car. A man gets out. Every guard present snaps to attention. Any doctors here? Doctors! Plumbers, masons, carpenters, musicians, whatever they needed, always doctors. 
That took five to ten minutes max. When that was done, this man stepped down over here to a spot that was a bit worn in the cement. If you look too young or too old, too weak or too sickly, not that you might have been sick, you might have just looked that way after the hell of the cattle car. If you were a mother with an infant or a child who was too young, if you were helping someone who was too old, maybe a stranger that you felt they were going to collapse and you just jumped up to help them. Any of those, this man looked at you quickly and the hand of the sick went this way and that's the way you went. If you look fairly healthy and strong, like you could put in a good month, a month of good labor, or perhaps six months, he looked at you quickly and the hand of the sick went this way and that's the way you went. It was up to the guards. They had full, full discretion on how far to take this beating. Sometimes the beating was fatal, usually not, just a severe beating. A, a blow would hit you in the head and silence your screams. Your body was left up here on the platform purposely, dying, dead, or struggling to live. As a warning to the rest of you, you go where this man tells you to go. That Within two hours, this whole thing was over. What had been one group is now many. The man gets back in his car and is driven away, and now every one of these groups is led on a different journey.